All right, San Francisco, welcome back. I hope you guys enjoyed your pizza break. Good pizza break. Good job all around. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Let's get this party started. So for our second half, this is a part that I really like because we've gone through all the different basic programming um, you know, breakdowns. And now we're going to get to more of the, the social part of um, our presentation, and that is for our panel. So at this point, I'd like to invite all of our panelists directly to the stage. Welcome um, Marty Romances, Robin Haddow, Michael Rosen, EJ Hassenfrotz, all to the front, please. Everybody bring it up, all of our, our panelists. Megan Newall, there she is. I was wondering where you're at. So let's welcome them all to the stage. So how this part is gonna work is, I just have a bunch of questions, right? So it's industry stuff, some of it's gonna be a little bit sensitive. Some of it's gonna be a little bit aggravating. Some of it's gonna be funny. I'm not in charge of the funny stuff. Uh, that's EJ's job. So he's gonna be your local comedian for today. And we have two mics up there, and this one's gonna be the third, and we can pass it around. So I'll just have that, so you can Thank pass you. it. Are they hot? They should be hot. Hot, hot mic. Hot mic. Hello. Hot mic. Hey. There Hello. he is. Okay, great, we have everybody. So, let's give them a huge round of applause and then we'll just dive in. I'll ask my, my questions and then we'll definitely have some time at the end for the audience to ask theirs. So, to get started off, San Francisco, um, does anyone have a favorite project that they've worked on that they'd like to talk about? Don't we all? <laughs> So it's funny when you talk about favorite project, because I feel like they're all equal parts heaven and hell. There's just the good things and then the things you get through. Um, I think I think of three different projects, and this is emblematic of my career, which has been all over the friggin' place. Um, early on doing the broadcast work, where you would have to throw together all of the different things. I remember working on pickup artists and having to do like 3D poser characters mixed with 3D, mixed with After Effects, and working at the mill where you could think of anything in your head and somebody else's job was to make it actually work. Um, and then later on, I think another heaven and hell moment was working at Google on some of their augmented reality concepts and thinking what you would do with all of the vast amounts of data they have on you, and what you could do with uh, the library of photos that they have mixed with location data, mixed with 3D assets, and what kind of crazy experiences would come out of that. So, different kinds of things. Yeah, um, I, uh, I agree about the heaven and hell thing completely. <laughs> I think that's kind of like why we're addicted to it a little bit. It's like it's it's pulling us, and we're we're kind of we have some sort of unfinished business with the work or something. Are you? It's a say, puzzle. Are you trying to say we're masochist? As, uh, yeah, as artists, I think so. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, I uh, I think about a, a couple projects that I did. Um, one was a, a Lagunitas beer project that I really enjoyed because it was a single shot. It was something I talked about at the last, um, eh, eh, one of the recent uh, NAB. Is this the one Max you gave me a video talk. for, Mike? Did yeah, there's, a, there's something there with a little bit of making of. Um, it's a single shot beer bottle. It has a lot of different aspects. It has a 2D animation character in there. It has a, a dynamics, and it was actually the first project that I was commercially doing uh, Redshift stuff on. So learning Redshift while I was doing this. and came up with this little hack to come up with the water level jiggling at the top and um, and that was a lot of fun it's you know it's a challenge um, and uh, I think I also like juxtaposing like different styles so you have the real style of the bottle and then the cartoon style of this little guy who jumps in there and that's I think a lot of fun and uh, then there was this uh, Microsoft Modern Workplace thing, another thing I talked about uh, a few years back at NAB, which has all this spectacular city lights and graphics and data going through it. And that's just always fun to like make something bombastic, something that's just like every second, every frame just trying to be impressive and, um, and like uh, sort of like impressive in a, in a sort of uh, bombastic way. Um, but I think talking about that heaven and hell thing again, like, I think that because this is our job, um, it's 
our sort of responsibility to ourself to try to refine the skill to make our last project our favorite project, to make the next project our favorite project. Because that is a, it's a skill, it's not, I mean, there is some of it that's luck, right? That's just like, oh, I got an awesome project. I think this one's gonna be awesome. Brando. But there's a, there's a lot of projects that is just, it's work. And we gotta figure out a way to, um, to make it fun for ourselves, which makes, it, which makes it better work for the client, if we can bring that fun to it. Oh, right, EJ? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, to piggy piggyback on what you were just saying, I don't know, can you do the, remember the dribble thing we did, the janky thing we did last time? You know time? what, I remembered all the janky things. You remember things, all the janky things? And here you are, here's your janky thing. Oh, uh, so yeah, uh, go down, so we're doing this thing again. I'm art directing. It's great, uh, keep scrolling. Down. Scroll down. Where do you want a lens flare? Uh, the <laughs> pigeon one. Yeah, all right. Yeah, oh, yeah, so go to that, and then go to my Behance link there. Actually, just, for the, the Behance link. So yeah. we're going to show you how to navigate that. the internet this afternoon with EJ. Yes. How to okay. And that is a web link that takes you to another page <laughs> in the World Wide Web. Let me tell you about the World Wide Web. This is okay, the so, internet. <laughs> so actually just save that link for the future so you just pull that up in the future. Um, so, <laughs> so this project was a project I did for Microsoft. And while it's not the best thing I've ever done, uh, like what Mike was saying, sometimes you just luck out and you get a client that pushes you without you having to push yourself. So uh, initially, this was for uh, a Microsoft page that this ended up going ultimately to um, uh, to WebGL, and like you could actually use the gyroscope on your phone if you went to this website and you could rotate it and like spin the character around. You can see it. So that was a challenge. Just like how do I get this working in that format? And actually, it ended up needing some other artist to take my model and, and spit it out into a web format, a WebGL form. But initially, it started out with just these inanimate objects, like uh, I don't know, uh, there's like the, the phone one, where there's just like a, a butterfly, and it lands on a phone, and it just kind of jumps around. And the art director was like, these animations have a lot of life and stuff like that. And this was when I was really trying to focus on my fundamental skills, because like I'm self-taught. What's that? I said it's me. <laughs> it's <laughs> you, yeah, it's Matthias. <laughs> um, I don't see the phone one, but. but uh, or actually it's a flower. Oh, I'm there, sorry. okay. Yep, that one. So initially it was just all these kind of like just objects. And the client's like, we really like the animation you're putting in there. And really how I landed this project was on my dribble page, I was just making random stuff, random inanimate objects, and just trying to breathe life into them. Because I found out that uh, because I didn't know how to animate, once I discovered, like, oh, the principles of animation, like, that's how you inject life and character into your objects. And I just, like, went nuts with it. Because it was just so much fun discovering those principles that, like, I didn't know about before. I started really focusing on that. So that's how I got found by Microsoft, is just posting my just random personal work, which, if that tells you anything, post things that you want to work on, and maybe a client will find you for that specific thing. So that's one thing. Um, but these were all inanimate objects, no faces, no nothing. And the, and the client's like, well, why don't you just like make these into characters? And I'm like, well, I mean, number one, you saw I can't model worth Jack <laughs> up there, so that was kind of scary. And I've never animated characters before. So what I initially started doing was just putting like cutesy faces on the inanimate objects like the phone and having it have facial expressions. And I found like, wow, this, that, that's actually kind of fun. And the client was really stoked about it. And then I ended up having to do like the Bob Rossi stuff and like all these other characters. And like the pigeon, I discovered like, hey, this whole character thing like lends directly into why I liked animating and injecting character into inanimate objects is like that's a whole nother level of animation you can apply to a character because you have the face, you have arms and all these other way all these other ways to express emotion. So this project was the very first project I ever really actually tried to do character animation. And if you've seen any of my work that I do now, like I'm leaning heavy into modeling characters, animating characters and just even like designing my own characters as well and like and trying released, to learn how to draw it, again. You just released some tools, right? You just oh, released so, your Oh yeah, limbs. so Bendy Limbs Rig for anyone who 
yeah, wants to get into <clears throat> rigging but hates the actual process of rigging, this is really, really, really easy way to rig. But I'm not going to be a shill for myself. That was all the bias, it's but I'll give you that check later. Yeah. <laughs> so you can animate and rig characters super, super easily. Um, and that's basically, you know, I'd never liked the traditional process of rigging. It was way too technical. And if you've watched any of my tutorials, I only teach things that are very basic and easy. I'm not trying to show off my technical skills because I have very little of them. Um, but yeah, that project, it was, it was, it means the most to me because it was that project and my clients pushing me to do character stuff that actually made me fall in love with like, hey, I actually love doing this and want to lean more heavily into that, so. Very cool. And then Robin and Marty, you guys haven't tuned I, in, but you're, you're some of my favorite folks. I mean, I, I love everybody up here because I brought you guys <laughs> out to all the different events, but you guys have helped create the MCU, and that, to me, the nerd <laughs> in me is just like, I'm uh, amongst, you know, as I, guardians up here because this is, this is a big deal. So I have to say, like, my favorite project wasn't an MCU, sadly. Okay, and well, it, it was, should be, but it was, it was especially talking about, like, the challenge and something that, you really, really need to spend lots of hours and sweat it out and really, when you find the challenge and that reward and something, you have to work very hard. And for me, it was The Martian, which I decided to put the challenge of doing that myself as a solo project. And we, you know, designing 420 screens for, for Ridley Scott's small film that used to be named that and end up being what it was. So I think that for me was the... The so one most special what project. Was it, what made it so special? To well, you? just having to, just trying to push it for a solo project and just doing all designs myself rather than tackling that with an entire team. And I think that is when you feel that you are comfortable doing what you do, especially, I don't know, every now and then, especially after 15 years, you find yourself comfortable, you find yourself that you are good, that you're doing what they ask you to do. And I think if you stop there, you are limiting yourself on that growth that you can push for more and challenge yourself and say like, well, I'm gonna put this big challenge in front of me and I'm gonna tackle it no matter what. And mm -hmm. even if that means working like 14 hours a day for months, that's uh, at the end, that's the project that I won't be very most proud of it rather than the project that I did very easily on an afternoon um, or a few weeks and we all went home at 3 p.m. and had a beer and, and it was easy to do. I probably, that's not the project you would want to show off to everyone, usually is a project that you really have a hard time, the one that you wanna proudly show uh, to everyone, and that's why, I, that's why so, I, so I would choose that to, one. did you have to fight people to say, just, just me, I'm the only one working on this, or? No, I, it was, I mean, don't, don't tell to Fox that we charge for four people, but um, <laughs> mainly, no, no, I'm joking. Uh, mainly it was just like a decision of like, can I do it? Can I, can I do like a double shift if, if needed? And, do everything of course on the animation side there's there was there was right. help and there was a team that helped me um but on the design like, this is something that i wanted to try can i can i tackle 420 screens myself 420 yeah but but then you start learning other ways to work to get to that point where you find ways to work in a modular system uh, and you find ways to optimize your design uh, methodology and you start creating things in a way that can be um, not replicated, but you can be reorganizing things and you're just focusing really on this 120 screens that need to be very, very much narrative driven and the director wants specifics to be told um, for, the, for the story of the film. And then the rest is almost like jiggling things around. So you build um, basically a whole system for you to work with. Yeah, to, yeah. Wow. and even in that, in that project, uh, especially because this is a, uh, Max on uh, panel, uh, I discovered lots of ways on how you can create those graphics that are rendered as a 2D graphics, and it's something that I touch on my C-graph in Vancouver. Um, as a, you know, you can, you can deal uh, with 2D graphics rendered from Cinema 4D, um, you know, in a, in a flat way, in a way that they look 2D, but they are not. They, are, they have dynamics and they have systems, and right. that's something that also in that in that project, it was needed. We could not go with the super flashy, uh, glossy renders. It would needed to be very technical and functional look and feel. So yeah. that's right. And if you guys haven't seen any any of the tutorials, all of their tutorials are online on uh, c4dlive.com. So I'll pull that up at the end, but you'll be able to see all the different stuff they've presented uh, throughout the years with us. 
And I think that leaves us with Robin. Robin, you got uh, something you want to share, or should I pull up your reel? What should I uh, show the people? Um, Sure, you can pull up the reel. I have um, a few different favorite projects. I... I'll let this play while you talk about it. Or do you want that music? We you need the music. Bass? It's all Jay. Like, like, we need the music for the reel. We the can music. mute out the uh, other one. So that's a compilation of my work uh, in the last maybe seven years, I think. And there's a little shout out to Territory. Marty invited me to jam on uh, Mile 22 a couple years ago. And that was a super fun project. They're always so unique. There's always some like takeaway or um, memorable uh, moment from each project. And I think that um, just stepping back a bit, I think that if the, there isn't something that's challenging or hard or a moment where you grow, as artists we crave change and we um, intuiti intuitively like learning and discovering new things, we're sort of like artistic explorers to get into design out. I sometimes go on these like deep diver design expeditions with my friend and we get into like line and we'll, we'll just get into line for days and just online just be uh, sending images back and forth and um, conversation or just like look at this and what about this and pointing out different things so I think there's like an intuitive um, like cartographer aspect to um, us as creatives um, and that's also to go back to the heaven and the hell like that's the hellish part because you're working against a deadline and the pressure of wanting to do well and succeed so for like I've been a, a freelance motion graphics artist um, for a while now, and I've been focusing on uh, specifically a, the little niche of fantasy user interface for the past seven years. And um, I've worked on over 50 productions. I was going through uh, my credit list the other day when I uh, needed to get some information. 
And some shows I've completely forgot, like whole sets and whole shows I've completely forgot. Um, and so those are things where I find like, oh, I, like I wasn't growing, I was just um, exercising um, like some motions of design or doing repetitive motions that I needed to do in order to uh, get the job done. And it's the jobs, I think, where there's that like aha moment that um, are really satisfying and also, or if like, like EJ did with the Microsoft stuff, if you, if the client finds something or pushes you to like venture in uncharted territory that feels like a little bit like unsure, you're not, you're less confident, but they believe and they sort of push you into that um, are things that I look back on and I'm like, I need to print that. Like that was something that I feel super proud of. And um, I'm sort of going off on a couple of different tangents. So there's two projects I want to talk about. One um, is uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp because I was invited to work on this project um, I, maybe two or three years ago now, I can't quite remember, with a colleague of mine, um, Decca Digital, his name's Corey Brammel. And I love superheroes, first of all. So to be asked to um, work on this project was a milestone in so far as we were given total um, creative freedom to create Hank Pym's lab, who um, is, Michael Douglas plays his character in the movie. And what was particularly interesting about this project is here we are creating the lab for a scientist who has essentially invented a Pym particle. Okay, so what is a Pym particle and what does that look like? So it was a complete uh, open canvas. And I thought, well, okay, um, let, here we, we have like a huge amount of creative freedom and a huge uh, creative space, but let's also make it so that us as individuals can relate to some of what we're seeing and what's going on to make it look like um, a, a familiar analysis or science or technology or something that we um, can have a bit of a takeaway to. So what is a pin par particle? Okay, well, it can shrink people, it can make people grow, it can do time travel, it can make a person old, it can go to alternate dimensions. Um, the fourth dimension? Maybe the fifth dimension? <laughs> I don't know, okay. So like, what does that look like? So one of the themes that uh, Corey and I were batting back and forth was uh, circuitry. Because in all of technology, there is uh, uh, circuits and this uh, electrical current and this could be sort of like a pulse or the energy that was that is deep inside the pin particle and then what if we tied in uh, some of the suit and the fabric because to, I love superheroes like I said and to me what makes a really awesome superhero is if you have a kick-ass suit and you have a wicked vehicle that's all you need so how do we tie in and bring these two things together? So one was um, taking the layer, or looking at the suit and being the bee, and also like sci-fi sort of fun trope there is the hexagon. Everybody loves a fancy sexagon for sci-fi stuff. So, um, well, uh, good timing. Like so, some of the reels, I use MoGraph to um, build out um, some hexagon-shaped widgets that were uh, I was trying to infer that this was the technology or the underlying fabric of um, Ant-Man and Wasp's suit while also um, wanting to um, combine uh, circuits and um, the technology and that sort of electrical part, pulse. So what if we only showed the audience like a little um, peekaboo or a keyhole glimpse into this like wider underlying fabric of um, the pin particle which could take you to the quantum realm and to me um, at the time it was um, exploring into uh, or diving into some new uh, tools that were out there X particles and the network node modifier at that time was hot on the scene and what I really liked about that was the uh, uh, controllable controllability that's a word because the, the uh, access that you could control all of your grids and the live draw simulation feature and the angle. And so I wanted to create a whole bunch of different simulations that you could layer up and create these different levels of complexity and generating all of these circuit simulations and 
um, that was sort of the tipping point for how we got on a roll with creating all these assets that eventually um, we used to fill out a, ho a whole bunch of screens in that set. Uh, another one that I would like to share with you was I was invited back in um, 2011, I think, by Microsoft to um, do some early prototyping for what we now know of as HoloLens. And that was completely new. I had no idea, obviously, what that was. It wasn't announced. It was a um, tented project. And I, too, was not even invited into um, all of the discussions or the meetings about what this product was going to mean and what it was to become and uh, what sort of the early development infrastructure was to look like. So I would fly in every two weeks um, and be in a room with white walls and we would just um, whiteboard and talk about ideas and questions and I would get information and receive notes. And um, the canvas for HoloLens was described, because it wasn't HoloLens, it wasn't a thing. How that was described to me was is this 360 degree view or sphere, if you will, of layered technology and how do you um, design information that's coming at a person real time in a way that's understandable and digestible and how do you create your hierarchies and um, like information design. And that was a, just a wild, wild project. And one of the like technical cha challenges for me that I remember at the time was I decided that I was gonna up my MoGraph game. This is funny, I don't think I've ever told you this, Matthias, and I got into the MoGraph module, and I built this full um, system, 100% in MoGraph, that was totally dynam dynamic, it was fully rigged, where you could have as many like different games, um, sort of to make it like a tangible working prototype, we prototyped with the Formula F1, and a whole bunch of other um, sports games. And so how do you make a system where you're displaying um, an infinite amount of information? So sometimes there's four games, sometimes there's a thousand. So how do you build something that's super ro robust, just make it look exciting into like this 360 degree view and um, pull it, pull, like sort of extrapolate one game out of a massive um, environment. And then within that node, if you will, there's a whole bunch of, um, more layered or stacks of information. So in terms of like information design and just getting into the MoGraph module, uh, that was another favorite project of mine. Is, is that anywhere that people will be able to see it? No. Is it never released to the public? It's never released. Ne never I anywhere? Could. You know, I know. I, I don't well, have it. Well, just release there, the yeah. rig if it's still available. I'd, I'd love to see it's that. Cool. I'm sure, yeah, sure yeah. folks will want to check that out. Yeah. So this, this, I want to get more engaged with the audience here. So I want to find out how many people here work at a studio who are working at studios. Oh, wow, just a few. Okay. Uh, freelancers? Freelancers in the house? Okay. And then anybody else? Is that a hobbyist or what, what else we got? A couple hobbyists? Okay. Cool. So... Um, that brings me to the question of what do you feel is the biggest challenge? Because we have, well, let me see, we got studios, freelance, we got a nice mix up here. Um, so what do you guys feel is the biggest challenge facing our industry today? And you can, you can do that from the studio standpoint or the freelance or just artistically. What do, what do you feel are some of the biggest challenges for us? So I, start. <clears throat> I think as a studio for us, it's reinventing ourselves like you have Marvel coming every year with a new film, you have Warner, you have all of these studios that you work with, and directors, and, um, and you, you know, you've been doing something, people want that, you know, they want, can you give me a margin? Hey, can you give me an Avengers? Can you give me a, so you can even categorize some of them, yet they still have a completely different script, a completely different story, and they do, you know, they do request a completely new, different visual language, um, so, at the pace that we work as a, you know, as a global company with different studios around the globe, um, having to start from scratch and invent something that's still compelling and that is still going to excite people and still going to excite the director, I think it is in itself a, a challenge, like starting every day. And, but I think that we are in an industry that do not stop offering us new tools and that's very refreshing and, and, and I think as long as we keep track of these new, stool, new tools or we even like work with uh, certain new technologies that are emerging, especially now here in the Bay, 
uh, and even we work for these technologies and we test them and we do test prototypes. All of these gives us uh, information of a very, very, you know, um, very true present that will allow us to um, speculate a bit more accurately when we have to speculate what's going to happen in 10 years, in 20, in another galaxy maybe. And, uh, and I, I do think like it's about keeping up with everything that's happening and just trying to always reinvent yourself and not try to do something that you've already done. Um, so I think so rein reinventing yourself. Yeah, reinvent and I can see that. Yeah. See that a big one. Anybody else? Uh, everybody doesn't have to chime in, but if you have something on here, what do you guys feel? You is know, the challenge? Um, one thing that came to my mind, uh, I've always thought that there's a couple backwards things in like typical um, production workflow, especially in, in commercials. Um, the the style frames thing is backwards to me. Why? I mean, we know we know you got to do the figure out how to make all the stuff to make your frame to make it seem like uh, it, to make make sure that it's going to be exactly the same. And that's the full. It can be animated. It can be all these things, and then show it and say like, "Well, is this a go?" So it's kind of I'm sort of I'm sort of combining the two, right? The pitch process and the style frames process as kind of like one. Um, I don't uh, I don't have like a good solution other than um, really developing relationships uh, with with clients, working with them more than one time so that you start to understand, have a language. Um, but I think that that's a, that's a tough thing. It's always been a st sort of strange thing to me. Um, sort of like back in the day, because I'm also an editor, um, people coming from editing film would be like, no, we, we just edit. We just edit the film and then music comes into it after we do our edit. And to me, it was always like, well, you really should start with a piece of music because there's rhythm there and there's there's something there's a vibe and there's something to play off of so i feel like that with the with the style frames too so um uh, and it, and it's just it's hard as a as i'm sure everybody here knows you it, just the pitch process itself i guess is that you're you're putting time and work into something and not sure if the job's even going to happen um, and, uh, and then I guess I would say the, um, the other sort of, uh, difficult thing is, uh, just a, just something that we have to, uh, be truly creative with is that there is a democratization of this stuff going on right now, just like, uh, documentary films were once just for uh, Ken Burns or whoever, right? But then digital cameras came out and everybody with an iPhone can now make a feature a documentary because they snuck in somewhere and filmed something. So now we have, everybody is going to be able to get Cinema 4D because it's super cheap and, and it's great because, you know, the more people doing it, the more we're gonna push the boundaries of the art, but there's also this other aspect where it's like everybody's now a motion graphics artist because they can slide text in with a plane effector with a delay effector and and it kind of looks cool so um so then how do you separate yourself how do that that becomes the challenge right and it's not really about can you make the tools go can you push the buttons it's about what kind of attitude do you bring to it? What kind of art do you do with the tool, with the paintbrush? And, um, and that's something that I super respect about everybody up here and, and, and the community that I've just come to know around Cinema 4D, going to Maxon events and, and uh, going to NAB and, and Seagraph is that um, they all are, uh, they all are characters who are, who are putting love into what they're doing, and that makes it art. Pretty cool. So I'm gonna, that was like, that was poetry right there. I'm like tearing up. Uh, but I'm gonna piggyback off of what uh, you just said. Um, yeah, the, the, I feel like we're, the thing that everyone did was everyone had After Effects, and everyone was doing the same thing. 
So how do you distinguish yourself? Well, you start adding 3D to that stuff. And so I feel like we're on that upswing of like, well, now if you're a studio that doesn't do 3D, yeah. you're you're kind of out of luck. So you have everyone. I'm seeing all these studios really start to get 3D. Everyone's starting to learn 3D as well. And Cinema 4D too, Cinema like 4D. particularly as particularly. The, the main one more and more. Yeah, it's the logical progression from After Effects to Cinema because that integration. I mean, that's why I went to Cinema 4D. Um, but yeah, it's never more. Uh, important to uh, not just be a button pusher. Um, software is always gonna change. Software, software is always gonna lower the barrier of entry. Pricing of the software is gonna lower the barrier of entry. So, uh, and, and, and software is always gonna make things easier. So if you just uh, hang your hat on like, well, I'm a very good technical whatever, or I'm a very good modeler, Volume modeling, like that's bringing that barrier down. So it's not about what what skill do you have. It's about what 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 are you bringing? What value personally are you bringing to, to the table? What's your creative persona? What are you putting out there? Uh, so with that creativity, just your voice, your creative voice, and uh, your fundamental skills, um, like fundamentals are never gonna update to R21. The fundamentals have been R1 the entire time. So I think it's never been more important, especially for so many people that you know, used to be editors. I, I've spoken to some people out there that they used to be editors and now they're trying to learn 3D. Uh, it's never been more important to really embrace that, um, like always, always learning every single day. Like your education doesn't stop when you graduate college. I mean, that's definitely true for me, um, trying to get better every single day. And that's not only just learning the tools, but that's also like, I was, you know, on the flight last, uh, yesterday and I'm like trying to draw because like, I want to get better at drawing. I used to be really good at it in college, but now I'm bad at it. Um, so it's always focusing on, on those fundamentals. And I feel like when I started focusing on animation, on design, and color, which I'm still struggling with, but I'm a lot better than what I was. Um, I just saw overall across the board, my, my work be much better, whether it's in After Effects or Cinema 4D or whatever, you know? Yeah, I think that there's this constant like fear of, oh, am I still relevant or how do I stay relevant in this sort of changing landscape? with the software prices coming down and new tools like content aware, you know, coming out, there goes half the rotoscopers. Like, you're right, totally. That's not going to change. But also with that, it's super exciting because I think it's taking this like, take or removing a myopic view out of what me as an artist and what are my skills and what am I doing and looking at more um, in terms of like a bigger, greater awareness. And for me, I think it was just like in order, like I've been freelancing and working contracts since 20, 2007. And to, in order to, for me to stay relevant, it was to be adaptable. So 20, 2007, Vancouver was a web town. It's where I'm from. And everybody needed a website. Everybody wanted a website. There are all these like massive advertising um, firms essentially that were, or creative agencies that um, had these like super cool flash uh, motion based websites. And so at that time, nobody really knew what motion graphics was. And a lot of the time, I'd, say, I'd take on all these web, this website client work and then push motion on them and say, well, what about an animated banner ad or like some kinetic type thing here? You like could advertise your um, company message. And it was very hard because people didn't, it was, it was like an education process of the value and the power of motion graphics. And over time, as you can see, it's sort of become a movement or an industry unto itself. Um, so. Anyhow, I go back to um, you know 2000 in the 2007, 2010, and whatnot. And there was a stock market crash in 2008, and all of the advertising budgets um, fizzled, and no longer there are these um, awesome projects, and the the phone wasn't ringing, 
But what was interesting at that time is because a lot of the um, disposable income wasn't there, so people weren't going to the movies, for example, on a date night, that would be $30 for two movie tickets, like popcorn, parking, $50. People were buying video games, and you could get a really sweet video game for $50 or $60, and depending on how good or dedicated or addicted you were to that game, that was your entertainment for one month or two months. So the, during that time, the video game industry totally um, peaked. And so I got into video games. A friend of mine was working at a local studio, and there was maybe him and two, me and another guy, there was two, uh, the three of us, ran this little motion graphic department, and I worked in video games for just over three years, doing in-game cinematics and marketing trailers. Actually, that was my first introduction to um, fantasy user interface and creating like future tech or fantasy tech. And um, when, from that, you know, a whole bunch, there's a tax incentive in the East Coast Canada, a whole bunch of video game studios had to close their doors. And um, Vancouver became a hotbed. It was slowly over time for uh, film and TV. And then I, somebody found me online and requested, invited me to set up the world for the pilot of The Flash. And that was like a huge passion project of mine and um, really uh, sort of took over my life for about uh, two or three months for that show. And then it, and then it was successful at Greenlit and, uh, you know, it went into what it is now, season eight or something. I was with, with the show for three seasons. Um, and, and anyhow, so it's just sort of like, um, sort of looking around at the creative landscape or the like artistic conscious and to see like where, what is the, de the demand, how can we celebrate the new technologies and where do you fit within that? I was like, I keep going back to this, Matthias and, and Noseman and I were um, invited over to Noseman Thanasis' house in Mississauga and he, for the first time, I had a VR experience with Coco, you know, the Disney uh, feature Coco and it blew my mind, the rich, like vibrant color and just the um, being in that headspace and that alternate reality, if you will, of the world in that world. And I'm like, wow, like what is this? Like what can we do with this? And this is, I know, of course, late. Like some movies, I think um, Jurassic Park, maybe you guys know, and some um, other movies have uh, extended beyond the feature film and have created VR experiences because people want to live in that world, that imagined world even longer. That maybe just right, I would assume Ready Player One might have that because it seems so fitting. So I think like we're gonna in the next people don't really know what to do with um, um, AR VR and all the mixed realities. I think we're just at the tipping point or the the top of the tidal wave, and pretty soon we'll see um, maybe an influx of that in different spaces. So it's very exciting to me. Yeah. So I think the biggest challenge is using the skills for good, telling stories that matter, the same old, same old. Like we are in an era where there are small budgets for interesting things and big budgets for things like banner ads. And how do you use your skills for good and, and make things that are meaningful to you? So that's the biggest challenge I see. All very, uh, all very relevant and where, where we're at with all the different challenges, which kind of brings me to like how things have evolved. So I've been with cinema the last 10 years and what got me into it was I, you know, I always wanted to make video games and movies and, and in college um, they presented me with a different program and I opened up the interface, I was overwhelmed and I got a degree in economics because I was like, this is way easier, this is so much, so much easier. And now I feel the, the barrier to entry is, you know, now anybody can jump in. As the youngest user I, I've, I've met, um, or I met the father, she was five years old in Austin, Texas during South by Southwest, and she was doing titles for her YouTube channel. So I was like, all right, there's the future, I might as well just pack it up, just, you know, put me in a pine box because I'm, I'm done. Um, and, and that's kind of where I want, wanted to see is because everybody has, a, you know, a take in it, you guys were all designers, no one just started in cinema, right? 3D, you guys are all on a different path. So what is it, what effect do you feel that cinema has had on the industry as a whole? I think it's incredibly positive. Speaking of coming from other industries, my, uh, my birth story, my 
however it's told. Origin story. Origin story, <laughs> there we go, there we go, thank you. Um, I started out using Flash back in the back in the back in the back there in the back go. in the day. And I've, I feel the same sort of excitement around cinema, and I have for, I started using it in 2004, so I'm no uh, Johnny come lately on this, but I feel the same sort of excitement around it in that you have this visual interface that makes these concepts really clear to you, and then you can take those concepts that you've learned and you can bring them to so many other things. So um, I think it's nothing but roses as, as far as, as a ease of tool. entry. Mm -hmm. And I think also on that, the community is super active. I find that if uh, I'm facing a technical challenge, uh, and I make a post on Twitter or on one of the socials, say, oh, like anybody experienced this or anybody have trouble with this? Like, honestly, in under five minutes, yeah. there was a response saying like, hey, yeah, like I'm doing that. I just um, stumbled up against this yesterday or and this is how I solved it. Or, oh, I totally know what you're talking about. Here's a solution. I find the community is um, so positive and solution oriented that it makes... It, anything that's daunting is totally gone. Like it just makes it achievable. Same thing. I do that all the time. I post something on Twitter. And, Does anyone know how to do this? You know, whatever number of hundreds of people who use Cinema 4D, and somebody's going to just be like, "Oh, all you do is you just, you know, Mirror X is the time reverse thing for keyframes." Or you know, like I wondered that for a while. Or what's rove across time is breakdown. Yeah, just learned that from uh, Ryan Summers uh, or somebody, or he learned it from somebody and reposted it or whatever it was, you know. Um, yeah, all the time, just some little thing I missed, posted up on social media. So the, 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 the community is really pretty amazing. Uh, I've never really experienced anything like it in any other subject matter, really. I just like the idea that there's a bunch of people who are, it's such a vast subject, right? What you can do in cinema. Nobody knows half of it, basically. It's always less than half that everybody knows. And so you got it. So everybody's interested in helping each other out. How could you not like that kind of scene? I think it's also because these guys are working so hard for every version that you have new things and that it's what helps that reinvention and bringing new tools to the table. But for me, like I think what really helped, and especially last year when we were collecting the the Oscars for, you know, the technical achievement, um, we we were with Max and showing how we use these and feature films, and for us to to kind of be able to help on on the motion graphic scene to be represented in a way in in in, in for the Academy, like to, thanks to Cinema 4D, we could be managing. Um, lots of polygons, lots of big Alembic files coming from Maya animations and all that stuff, but everything was ended up like into, you know, it was put together in, in Cinema 4D for a tool that can be handling these massive um, project files with massive pipelines. That is uh, an achievement in itself. Uh, and there's like, of course, other softwares doing this and that, but for the motion graphics um, industry and community, only Cinema 4D really does it and and yeah I think community is great and also you have more graph memes <laughs> of course memes you got to have the memes so um, we have a lot of different sponsors sponsoring this and one of the things that I try and do is really open up the dialogue between creatives and the companies because sometimes you know companies put out surveys but I know we're all too busy so I try and make it part of my job to you know, get the feedback firsthand from us artists and then keep peppering them until we get what we want. Um, is, is there anything that you feel that technology companies could be doing to help you know, support our, our industry more? Is there something more that, you know, a message to the collective of um, you know, the people who are the, the format of all this, the, the Dells, H, you know, the Dells, the uh, NVIDIAs, you know, all, all of us, we're all working for to create tools, but what feedback would you have um, for the industry that should be updated to make it even you know, better? You guys have a, a, you know, a Well, <laughs> Apple. <laughs> do I, yes. I mean, do I have to even say so anything no, more? I, I like, think, 
I think that sums it up. Because we're supposed to be, uh, no, no. Um, yes, I, I think it would be. Well, they're not sponsoring, so I don't okay. care. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I really like the Apple operating system better. Woo. Yes. Uh, uh, it's, I'm using Windows now, though. So that should say something <laughs> right there, you know. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a, there's a, a disconnect with the hardware and the software. So that, if you're talking about techno technology companies, uh, that's, that's huge. And so I've been dealing with it for the last good number of years, like five years, six yep. years. I was trying to make GPU rendering work on the Mac. <laughs> God. <laughs> Forget it. It's just, it just problems, problems, problems. And, they're, and they, they're only making it worse by like, discontinuing uh, what OpenGL or whatever, discontinuing, they're like fighting NVIDIA and NVIDIA is like what we need, right? For Redshift, for Octane, for whatever, you know, like it's pretty, so I, I hear good things are in the works. I'm, um, I'm, I'm really hopeful to get back on <laughs> a, a Mac um, so that I don't do twice as many clicks every day. So I'm, I'm going to keep it in a positive vein. In a but positive I way. In, in other words, positively, a I love the operating system right. that I, I hear what you're Apple saying. provides. In, in, it sounds like interoperability. <laughs> but I can't use it. It sounds like interoperability is more of the feedback. Because if, if that's the case, I'm actually talking to someone. Yeah. It's like what, what actual feedback, if they were going to start doing stuff, it seems like interoperability and making sure that they work with the programs and the technology that everybody else is using. Yeah, I mean, the artists overwhelmingly in 3D are using... NVIDIA technology, CUDA cards, so there's that. But I would say on a more broad stroke level, um, I think just anything that, uh, that brings the sort of paintbrush, musicality kind of, uh, um, the, the any <laughs> That sounds like a Windows to me. <laughs> <Was> that, <laughs> am I sound? being Mickey Mouse? <laughs> um, you have two ideas. I, I yeah, <laughs> two, two great ideas. Um, the thing that brings that, that creative inspiration uh, most instantly through the technology, uh, that's, that's the thing, you know, like, um, so as like a metaphor in old ways, like you might paint with one color and then close that can of paint up and then open another can of paint and then paint with that color and you're painting the same painting, but then like a smarter way or a more sort of um, inspiration-based ways to like open up all your colors, have a brush in each one of them, and, and, and then you can just, whatever, when the spirit strikes, you just use it. And um, that's something that uh, uh, technology companies are, are trying to uh, hopefully give to us, right? Give something that lets us have a moment of inspiration, have an idea, and then see it through without getting blocked by the, the, the ones and the zeros and, and the technology itself. I think, like, I mean, just going back to the HoloLens thing and all that, I think we're sort of at that um, sort of beginning of the tidal wave, for lack of a better way of explaining. Like, I just was over at Microsoft and um, was invited to try on the latest HoloLens 2. And it was a, a whole exciting world of, of, of holograms. And my friend was like, oh, here, and you can even do the paint. And so I, I was in, you know, real world 3D space, writing my name and changing the color and then moving through the curse of um, my signature and all this. So I think that we're, it's a bit of an exciting time in that it's totally unknown and the possibilities are there. It's just how, how I guess, how are those innovators going to package it and sell it and put it in a digestible um, product? So, so for, user, well, uh, as far as user experience, making sure that it's... Yeah, I think to tap into that, um, I'm a bit sick of people ideating and sitting on a meeting room for four weeks, spending half a million dollars talking about how good this could be. I think tech companies and everyone in general could benefit more from rapid prototyping and actually doing shit rather than talking about it, um, which in this city seems to be the, the, the biggest percentage of it. Um, so maybe giving more power to people who can create things and can prove if something will work or not in a couple of weeks rather than spending all that much money on these big salaries on people that they don't know what to do with their day. 
uh, so would be a good, would be a good idea, I think. You're talking about as these companies develop a new piece of software for us or they, to get Not creative. Not even software, I'm talking about like rapid prototyping and stop ideating um, so much. I understand that having an idea is very important and talking about how this idea could be is also very important. But I think uh, instead of having 90% of that and 10% of actually making it happen, if you invert that process and you start by doing it, you will find um, easier if something really works and answers uh, what people want and what people are going to be using it for. And if any, I think at all degrees, of course, it's, it's difficult to say with, you know, processors and graphics cards. Well, yeah, probably there's a lot of science behind it. But with a lot of things, I think rapid prototyping and inverting the, the typical pyramid that we come from on the there's the agency that thinks and have an idea and then there's like 25, <laughs> yeah, there's an idea from the agency and there's 25 people with all of that and then there's two guys who are gonna make something and change the whole thing because no one thought that this could be a use case until they actually make it happen. So making, le making more and, and ideating less could be a good feedback, I think. Anyone else wanna chime in on that one? I love the... Uh, the possibilities for AR and VR, uh, like at Blendfest, they were showing how they actually modeled some of the aspect. Uh, so this was um, uh, Gunner. Uh, so just look a uh, uh, Gunner Blend Blend 2019 titles. It's amazing. I don't know. I saw that today. Was, so they oh, actually man. showed how uh, one of the artists actually built some of the modeled some of the stuff in in a tilt brush, but to get it exported out. It, the mesh was pretty dense to begin with, and then to import it back into Cinema 4D, there's like all these things like you have to invert it and switch it upside down and make it much smaller. And don't do this though, because it'll do this thing. It's like, no, can we just make a thing, export, open, it's good. So, and even with that, um, so one thing that's really cool is um, well, what you used to be able to do is you uh, could export out a GLTF file, which is basically just a format that you could use for um, VR or AR kind of platforms. And on Maxon Labs, that's actually available. So it's such a new thing that it's not even packaged in the software yet, which is whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, it's just so new, but... Um, I wish it was just as easy to, to work in Cinema 4, or as easy to just export something out, putting it into, um, uh, what's the like, uh, what's the Snapchat Len Lens Studio, where you can actually get a model, like say it's a character, and program actions. So if like you poke it, it does a thing, or if you wave at it, it can actually sense that and wave back. Um, but that is, I feel like that's, the barrier for that is like, well, you have to code in all those actions. You have to know all that code to do that thing. Um, and I think why everyone loves Cinema 4D is there's no coding unless you really need to code, and like do Espresso or something like that. So I can't wait until the day where it's there's a MoGraph module for programming actions that you can then export to whatever AR application on your phone and you could easily do that and be like, hey mom, look, I did this thing. Poke the thing on the <laughs> AR and it does the thing. Poke, poke you know? the dough boy. Yeah, poke the... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's my wish. So interoperability seems like a Just big thing. Uh, Rapid prototyping is another, another big thing, it sounds like. Um, yeah, I, I definitely see, see those all and I think you know, taking, taking this concept and then applying it to the audience. So what, so we took a look from the technology side of the companies and we want the technology companies, what they, could they be doing different? What would you say to all the artists out here that are here and uh, tuning in and listening, what advice would you give them as we move in this, you know, really dynamic environment? What advice would you, you say to help them be more commercially viable? Let's say that, because everybody here likes making money with doing art, right? Is anybody here not? Okay, so good. So I think everybody here is looking to be more commercial artists, commercially viable. What skill set and what things do you think that they should add to their um, arsenal? Well, I, I think, um, first of all, try to have your own style. Um, show things that you want to do, not show things that you don't and you don't want to do again, because people are going to call you for that, so be careful on that. And, um, you know, try to have fun. <clears throat> and, and, and I think in general, like, as, a, as an artist, 
you have to, uh, as I said before, you get out of your comfort zone, but don't be afraid of jumping into other industries and see how your skills can be applied to that. You know, I, I started uh, in VFX as a flame artist, then I jump into video games. Why not? Then I jump into movies, then I jump into... So I think you learn a lot and you grow uh, faster and you, at some point, could have a, a bit of broader vision of, of lots of different things and how they starting to interconnect, uh, especially nowadays with technology and advancement how you, if you learn from each one of those, you could benefit a lot uh, and you will grow as an artist and I think in general faster than any other one that will stay in the same industry for uh, 20 years. Don't be afraid of code. <laughs> Don't fear the code. <laughs> we got a couple, couple fans. So uh, all, all these graphical user interfaces, I think that's what I was getting to is that they're these great visual metaphors and you get it and you see it, but it isn't that much different. You have a word to represent it instead of a drop down. And I mean, you know it, you showed us the formulas behind things. Uh, it's. It's that easy. You, you, you write it with the little fingers and uh, you make these magical spells and it's glorious. I, uh, I took C++ in college. That's the only class I ever failed. So I don't, that's just not for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it's really, really important to know a little bit about all of the things. Um, even if it's outside of your day-to-day, -day, your daily task or what you need to deliver in a day. Um, I constantly just buy all kinds of plugins to see how they work and what they do, regardless if I'm actually gonna use it. I think it's so important, even like Michael was going into and showing me Fusion, because I was like, oh, what's all this about? Like I think, to be able, now I know how to talk to a person who works in Fusion, I know a little bit. Just from that little bit. Just from that little bit, yeah. Just I can, like, yeah, so I can speak a language and we can both understand the workflow and the process. And also with that, you can then understand a little bit more of the technical challenges or even just like the workflow that um, an artist in that um, vein or who specializes in that one thing what they contend with and what they what they are working with. I think it just makes you more well-rounded, well-spoken person and just to be a better communicator. So when you're working on a team of people, like I just, funny, EJ said he was um, working on sketching or getting back into sketching, so it was something that he had just lost along the way. And me too, I just downloaded or um, signed up for a, a sketch course just because for no other reason than wanting to be able to draw a decent or just not shitty looking thumbnail and and so far as to be able to so that I can communicate an idea to people that I'm working with or I can sketch out something walk away from it for a couple hours or a day and go back to it and be like oh yes there's the composition or that's the idea and it's not just like at this point I'm like who drew it M my, me or my four-year-old <laughs> so and that is like totally anybody's game like you know and I think it's important to just stay sort of it, it tuned in to um, just every, or things outside of yourself, basically. Let me see if I have this all right. I'm, I'm trying to run it back. So we have, have your own style. This is a big one, one going out there, having your own style. Learning code. Michael, what was yours? I haven't said it yet. Yep, so he hasn't said it yet. It's, and I'm then we have to, yeah. don't learn it's code coming. From, from EJ. <laughs> and then with Robin, yours is? The, and, and be aware of all the different systems. Those are all good. Okay. And then so mine is be lucky. Ooh. <laughs> be lucky to be here. Be lucky to be working on Cinema 4D. Be lucky to be showing up for whatever gig you're on at the time. Feel that luck because you are lucky. And, he, and you know, it really just goes to this. The general principle is this, right? You whatever, get as close to what you want to be doing and do that. Do that as well as you can. Feel good about doing it. Give the most that you can towards that for the purpose of what that is, right? So like they might not be trying to sell what, you know, you might want to do some character animation that's really just artistic and here you are sliding Subway sandwiches across the screen or whatever it is, right? I've been there. And, um, and 
do it as well as you can for the purpose for, for the people who are working on that with you, you know, and then go move to the next one. When you see an opportunity to get closer to the thing that you really want to be doing, maybe it changes, like Marty's saying, you know, then move towards that if you see an opportunity. But start where you are, wherever you are, and realize that that's that it's we're incredibly lucky to be working on this stuff. And uh, I think that that kind of positive nature is um, what can really uh, bring the right kind of stuff to the, the projects. So luck, another way that I'm going to say that is grateful and gratitude. And I, I'm, Thank you. I, definitely, I would definitely say yes, lucky, but gratitude is something you can actually do. Luck is, you know, I'll take that to the crafts table, but, um, <laughs> but gratitude I think is, is exactly what it is, is, is being in all these different situations. And I want to actually um, give a big round of applause and thanks to all of our, our panelists here. A lot of gratitude for you guys and what you do for the community over, I mean, the last 10 years of being here. And I want to uh, open it up to our audience, so make sure that if you guys do have a question, you, we have a, a panel here. So we have about another 15 minutes, so we should be able to get another two or three questions in, and then we'll have a break time, and we'll be able to move out and uh, network. And that's what I would say is one of the best things that you can do. So they all said they're, they're, they're different pieces. One piece that I'm going to give is network, right? So what you know is a very minimal compared to the value of who you know. Right, so being able to pick up the phone, being able to have people actually respond to you, being engaged with the community. I've been traveling for the last 10 years all across the US and now I'm starting to move over into Europe and this community is thriving pretty much everywhere. So every city that you go to, there's probably already a friend or somebody that you could work with or somebody you'd probably want to hire on a project that you just don't know yet. So that is an aspect of business they don't really teach us too much at an art school or any of the other schools, even in economics, a little bit in marketing, actually a lot in marketing, and that is network, right? Your network is akin to your net worth. So if you have a small network and you don't socialize and you don't know, know people and you're not connected to them, you're not connected to that big project that they got put on that they're gonna call you about. So just keep that in mind and just having a friendly, positive connection with people in the industry is gonna open up the world of possibilities to you. So I just wanted to encourage you guys in, in that world to, to meet someone new, at least two or three people here because these are all other people that you could possibly be working with. So I wanna open this up to the audience and see if we have any questions for our uh, audience. So the question is, what do you wish you knew when you were a rookie that you knew now that like that would have saved me a whole Oh, bunch. I'm going to take it to a technical point is the selection tools. I learned the selection tools way too late. <laughs> and I just remember, you know, needing to make um, edge selections or polygon selections and going in and um, manually painting to grab what I needed. And it was way too late that I discovered the hidden menu. Is it the V key or the U key or one of them? And I'm like, oh, what's that? And then I was curious about that. And like, oh, the whole loop selection, grow that selection or invert it and select that. And that, um, just going in and learning those like hotkeys even for what those are really, really sped up my workflow and um, I was just like shaking my head at how late I stumbled on those. Uh, mine's gonna be more top level and I think the, the lesson throughout my whole career is just I've been ignoring the fundamentals and been slowly trying to make up for the fact that I've been ignoring the fundamentals. Um, so if there's anything from that, it's to uh, embrace your uh, weaknesses. Uh, I ignored mine for a long time, and I think for 3D, uh, just as an educator, you know, I, I have a lot of people that are completely new to 3D, and I see their work. Um, focus on lighting and composition, and really like get into photography because I think that's a great way that translates directly into 3D. Even like buy a, don't buy a, you know, don't watch tutorials all day. Buy a book on studio lighting and studio photography because how people light in real life or in movies, like way back when Hollywood was first a thing, like all of those fundamental skills of lighting and, and texture and lights and all that stuff and shadows, like all that stuff directly relates to 3D and just how do you compose a shot? Uh, Matthias, I don't know if you use the line about like the 3D, like your viewport is the your set, your stage, yeah. 
and when, the when objects that, are all they your were taking notes on that part. Yes, were, exactly. So everyone's got that written down. I think that's very, very important. And again, this is just something that, like the past few years, I've really been trying to uh, uh, learn more about. And I think with Redshift, there's that instant feedback. So it's never been faster to really get better at lighting because you have that immediate feedback. You're not moving light, hitting render, and then getting a coffee and seeing like, oh, well, that looks like crap. Let's move it over here and hit render again and get another coffee. Um, so yeah, uh, especially 3D, I feel like that's one of the weaknesses people struggle with the most is lighting. Uh, one thing I, I uh, that's one of, uh, one of the lessons in my Cinema 4D base camp at School Motion is you light a scene with no textures at all. So you're not relying on putting lipstick on the pig by throwing on stock textures and shiny textures and da da da. Because if you can light, if you can make a, a uh, just the simple objects with no textures whatsoever look really good with just lighting, man, like you can make anything look good throughout the rest of your career. And composition as well. And light, color, and composition, composition, like light and composition. I oh, think, yes, yeah. yeah, composition, composing your shot, yeah. Yeah, the fundamental, I mean, I agree with, I agree with both of what you guys said. Um, on a technical level, though, in, in Cinema 4D, I, I feel like I got into layers too late. Like, not too late, but, you know, later than would have been better. Um, <laughs> I mean, knowing, knowing how to, you know, so that's just the standard thing, right? The organize your stuff with layers, turn off things that are chomping away at the processor. Um, but I think in, in all of these programs, After Effects, whatever, um, remember that you can make tools for yourself just by the way you decide to always do things, your routines. Um, you can make something work in a way that it doesn't work for anyone else in a program. I remember the first time I saw, I think it was Mike the Monkey, um, just taking a null in the object manager and going like dash, 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 dash. So it just makes a line and just make another one down here with a line and now you've got a section that's just sectioned out. And that's just by just doing things a certain way, right? There's a new plugin now. With that, that, I saw that. Yeah. It was really cool, you know? Take like, that yeah. note. And actually, speaking of a, another new little plugin, somebody else, I forget. Yeah, I wish I could say who it was. But there is a new little script out there for renaming your materials after the objects that they're assigned to or your objects. Uh, you can rename your objects through. in a quick little way. Very nice. Just give it a little hot key. Um, but yeah, I think that's the idea is that, that the, the, uh, you're, you're making something, a lot of the time in Cinema 4D, there's so much in there. So when you build something, as EJ was showing us so, so much, you're, you're set it up, right? But what you're, what, remember what you're setting up. You're setting up something that's going to allow you to play, right? Like once he sets up the sound effector and the field with the sphere and he's got that all there, now don't forget to play. You set up a toy, right? So that's your toy now. You made that so that you can play with it. And that play, that energy that you put into it, that's, that's value like, because it's fun for you. So it's, hopefully it's fun for somebody else to see. So, so you know how you do that is your own method. For instance, one idea is to uh, name your, you know, everybody says name your stuff for organization and that sort of thing. Maybe you have fun with the way you name your stuff. Instead of calling it, uh, you know, plain effector one or, or whatever, maybe you just call it Jim <laughs> and Joe. And, you know, like maybe that's a way that you just remember that. And if you ever have to send off your, pro you know, so figure out your own way, right? And same thing with like Fusion or After Effects is that uh, you, you've got your own way to organize your own stuff or your folder structure even. Like I, I organize my folder structures based on program that things either were output from or the program files themselves. So like After Effects files go in the After Effects folder, but After Effects outputs go in the After Effects outputs folder. That way there's no prescribed order of operations. It's just wherever something came from, that's where I'll find it. Uh, and if you ever need to send your stuff to someone else, well, you can always take that moment to sort of structure it in a way that they'll understand it. That's usually part of the job if you, if you are, um, you know, if that's the kind of job you're doing, creating a package or something. So I would just say again, like, if you're, 
um, whatever you're working in, and, and working across programs too. Uh, like, I don't know if you have it there, Matthias, but uh, there was a talk I gave um, for this uh, watercolor effect called Why Not Home. It was a documentary on home birth. And, uh, and it was a, a, a process that I, I perceived, I, I sort of picked up a little bit from Chris Schmidt, and then uh, um, it was sort of a combination of tools. Right, so it's not just in After Effects, it's not just in Cinema 4D. You can't do it without either one. You have to do it with both of them because it's using blend modes through Cineware and takes outputting into different layers in After Effects and then blending them with blend modes, which you basically can't do in Cinema. So you need both of those things there to, to create that effect. And, um, and that became my tool. So I think that's the thing that I didn't know when I was starting out. You watch tutorials. Actually, when I was starting out, there weren't many tutorials. Uh, there wasn't even YouTube. Um, there was something called Creative Cow. <laughs> Aaron Rabinowitz. <laughs> he was he was the guy who taught me After Effects, essentially. Um, uh, but uh, so you know, you watch tutorials. You you know, you should remember to pick up just the 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 notion of what these elements in the tutorials do, but you're almost never gonna have a job that's just the tutorial, like I want this done, so now here's the recipe. Uh, so, you know, remember that, that you can make it your own, and that's, that's allowed. So I said, don't be afraid to code, and now I'm gonna say, don't be afraid of ugly, because I feel like you, Really, it's part of the process, and sometimes what is on your monitor is not very good to look at, and you just have to keep going and keep pushing through it. Make yourself another 12 versions, and eventually you're, you're going to find one that has a thing that you want, and then you build on that, and you make another 12 versions, and then, then you start to get to some place that you feel good about. So don't be afraid of ugly, and surround yourself with all of the different, different versions of beauty. So you're not just looking at one thing and trying to make somebody else's one thing, but you're looking at 12 or 13 different other beautiful things and figuring out what to pull from each one of those to make your own uniqueness. I think um, <clears throat> it's something that I think everyone who's starting should know, which is there are no shortcuts. and. Um, there's no such a thing as self-entitlement, which all, also in this city, it seems to be a trend. Um, <laughs> you have to get there, and uh, you have to get there by grinding every day, uh, every month and every year, and maybe after 15 years, you will say, oh, well, maybe now, you know, someone decides that I'm ready to be an art director, because uh, really that seniority that you gain every day is something that, that is, is the value that you will bring into a team. And if there's someone more junior than you that will need your help, ideally, they will need help from someone who has been there before. No, not from someone who has jumped from one to another to get a bigger salary and another position. And like, what's, what's the point of that? Also, the nice thing is about the journey and just grinding every day and finding these things rather than jumping to the end line. So just go step by step and it's, it's beautiful. All really great feedback. That's awesome. So um, I'm going to give a big round of applause to our presenters. Please join me in, in doing that and our sponsors and for you guys making it out here in the middle of your week. So um, we're going to break and call it a day, but we're going to be available, or at least some of us, if you guys are going to be around for a little bit, come say hello uh, as we're breaking down and, and setting up. But um, definitely, the thing, like I said before, network, get to know somebody, find a new uh, handle to follow. Um, we're all in this together. To me, this is my big creative family. That's why I do hugs and not handshakes, because I feel everywhere we go, it's a network of creative people that make all the things that we love and inspire us. So I want to thank you guys for showing up and doing what you do, and I will see you at the break. Thanks again. <laughs>
MoGraph.com, an online resource for motion graphic artists. Start your week with the MoGraph podcast, industry news, interviews with your favorite artists, and terrible humor. Watch live shows and interviews from MoGraph events like NAB, Seagraph, Half Res, and local meetups. <laughs> Our MoGraph talks feature live demos and motivation from artists all around the world. Sometimes you gotta make stuff that you're not gonna put on your reel, and I'm not here to judge. What if Rick and Morty show up for the countdown at midnight? That's where I peaked in life, in my career. We gotta stop this thing, Rick! It's gonna kill us all! Hear from the people that create your software, design your render engines, and artists that are changing the face of modern motion graphics. You get that render done. Yeah, you better frame frame what? MoGraph tutorials and online classes will teach you about Cinema 4D, After Effects, as well as other popular software and render engines. Throw in HDR Studio, take the render settings, pick the HDR, put a reflection, and gorgeous. Branch into new software, learn time-saving tips, techniques, workflows, and lessons that'll keep you up to date in the world of motion design. Oh, brother, those are some of my favorite elves. I love projects that scare me. When our art director comes to us and asks for something that I had never done before, man, it gets me pumped. Join the conversation in our live sessions. Check out our plugins or join the hundreds of daily active users in our Slack channel for technical help, advice, contests, or just to joke around. Real nice banana. Ah, that's so funny. All right. I'm going to live forever. <laughs> Subscribe today and get the latest updates on our YouTube and other social media channels. Take all your dreams and just do it! We don't care how you get here, folks. Just get here. Subscribe to MoGraph.com.